Thank you. Good morning. And thank you for joining us uh, for this event today. My name is Lucy Griffiths and I'm a member of the Office of uh, External Affairs at the US, AG, or US International Development Finance Corporation. We're often called DFC and we're America's Development Bank. Uh, just a little short intro for DFC is we uh, partner with the private sector like yourself uh, to finance solutions to the most critical challenges facing the developing world today. We're pleased to be joined by DFC's Chief Operating Officer, David Marchick, as well as our special guest, U.S. Representative Young Kim with the California 39th District. So thank you for being here. Today's event is an opportunity to focus business leader, focus uh, local business leaders and, and to help them understand the best way to go about with potential future collaboration. But before we jump into the more extensive presentation on the business end, uh, we're going to be pleased to hear opening remarks from Representative Kim, Kim after which uh, Representative Kim and Dave Marchick, our, our Chief Operating Officer, will go ahead and treat us with a fireside style chat. After that, we'll launch into the business related DFC presentations and we'll culminate in a open Q&A session, at which point you'll be able to ask whatever may be your burning questions. So please keep track of them during the event. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Representative Kim. Thank you for being here and we look forward to your remarks. Representative Kim, are you there? Oh, sorry about that. I <laughs> Technology, it's getting the best of us, no worries. I know. Good morning, everyone. Lucy, thank you so much. I want to thank all the businesses in the California 39 district and beyond. Uh, several of you have joined that may not be from directly within the 39 district, but do you live here, you do a business here, and I really want to thank you for taking the time uh, to join us. Uh, you are in for a great retreat. Uh, you're going to be learning more about the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation and the many ways that this agency can support small businesses that are interested in investing in the developing world. As many of you know, so much of my work in Congress focuses on creating jobs and opportunity for individuals in this district while supporting the small businesses that are so critical to our local economy. You know, I serve on the Small Business Committee, Science, Space, and Technology Committee, as well as on the Foreign Affairs Committee. So I can see that in today's world, we have a world that is increasingly connected by immigration, by trade, by technology. There is significant opportunity for American businesses in emerging markets. Currently, Many of the world's most rapidly growing economies are in developing countries, especially in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Many of these countries have a great need for investment in technology, healthcare, agriculture, modern infrastructure, and energy. You know, American industry has so much to offer, and DFC can help by providing the investment tools that can help a business get started or expanded into a new market. DFC is a U.S. government agency focused on mobilizing investment in the developing world, and it has already more than $33 billion invested in more than 100 countries, and it partners with many U.S. businesses. So today, you will be hearing from the DFC team, team of experts who will provide more in-depth business development presentations and discuss technical assistance programs they can help you with investment decisions that you plan to expand your operations overseas and especially in the developing nations. But before that, I'd like to first welcome DFC's Chief Operating Officer, David Marchick, and we will have a quick uh, conversation so you can get a better understanding of what DFC does and what DFC is. So welcome, David. Um, I want to uh, maybe start by asking you, uh, instead of me trying to read through the entire impressive uh, resume, 
I know that you have an extensive background in business and private equity. So can you tell us a little bit more about your own background and what led you to join the FC? Sure. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Congresswoman. Um, for those who are constituents of Congresswoman Kim's uh, district, you should know that she is a vigorous advocate for the district. She has uh, represented the district very well. She is strongly uh, always pushing and prodding to do more for the businesses in her district, and she has a you know, fantastic international outlook. So thank you very much for your leadership and for the opportunity to be here. Um, I actually grew up in California, in Northern California. I went to school in Southern California. I had a girlfriend that lived in the 39th district, um, mm -hmm. but I'm now happily married 20 plus years and uh, know your district very, very well um, and know that part of Southern California very, very well. Um, I spent, uh, I moved to, DC, to Washington DC in my twenties. I spent uh, seven years working on international trade uh, during the nineties on NAFTA and the WTO and, and US Japan talks. Uh, and then I spent a number of years at Carlisle where we invested all around the world, including in emerging markets. Um, after leaving Carlisle, I decided that I wanted to basically spend the rest of my life uh, giving back and, and serving the public. And so when the opportunity to, to work at the DFC came up, I, I jumped at it. It's a fantastic uh, organization that's having a significant impact on the world and helping U.S. businesses uh, expand overseas and in emerging markets. So thank you again for the opportunity to, to share this time with you. Thank you, David. Glad to know that you have a good uh, connection to the 39th district. Um, so I know that we have some folks joining us today who are just learning about what DFC is. And we uh, introduced in the opening remark, DFC as the US government's development finance institution. So can you tell us a little bit more about the agency and its mission? Sure, what we do is we provide different financial products to businesses operating in developing countries. So we focus on low income and lower middle income countries. There's a World Bank classific classification of different countries. And we believe as Congressman does that the private sector can be perhaps the most important tool for driving economic opportunity, for driving jobs, driving innovation and for driving economic development to lift people up and give them more opportunities. So businesses need capital to grow and thrive as all of the uh, folks in the audience know since you run and, and lead small businesses. And we provide different products to businesses to help them grow and thrive. So we provide debt, we provide political risk insurance since operating in some of the countries where we operate in low income and lower middle income countries is very challenging. And we also, thanks to the BUILD Act, which the Congressman worked on when she was, I think, a staff person uh, before she became a, an elected member of Congress, uh, we now have the authority to invest equity to help drive growth and opportunities for US businesses and businesses operating in emerging markets. You know, um, thanks for mentioning that um, for anyone who's joining us, uh, capital to access is really important, especially even if you've been around for a long time, uh, you're always trying to expand and understanding where we can get that extra uh, resources and capital is critically important. And DFC, you mentioned uh, Build Back, um, uh, initiative. I did actually work on that when I was in the state assembly serving as a vice chair for the assembly committee on JETI committee, we call it jobs, economic development and the economy. So I was very supportive of that. Uh, thank you for mentioning it. But uh, let's talk about what the difference is between DFC from other government agencies like USAID that work in the developing world. Right. So great question. So if you think about the different US government agencies, there are several that are operating to support US businesses or to support development. So USAID, for example, provides mostly grants and 
uh, basically gives money to NGOs and others operating in developing countries to support really important projects in water and sanitation, in food, in agriculture. Um, so that's mainly what USAID does. They operate all around the world. For example, right now they're they're spending an enormous amount of time, energy, and resources in Haiti, helping uh, the Haitian people recover from the terrible earthquake. Um, they operate all over Latin America, Africa, Asia, including Southeast Asia, um, but they mostly operate through grants. There's another agency called the Export Import Bank of the United yeah. States. They provide export financing. So if you are a US exporter that wants to sell your product abroad, they can provide financing to help you export essentially, either directly or to your customers to help them providing export finance. We're focused on investing in emerging markets. So if you are a US business, that wants to expand, for example, in Vietnam or Indonesia or India um, or Latin America, we can provide financing to help you expand your business, to help you expand manufacturing or expand distribution abroad. So one of the things we're doing right now is we're working very hard to expand the capacity of manufacturing all around the world for vaccines. Mm -hmm. And we're working with US companies like Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson and Moderna. So we're obviously doing this remotely. We wish that we could be in Fullerton or another part of the 39th district in person, um, but we're in a, we're in a uh, pan global pandemic still. And the numbers are quite staggering. So prior to the onset of the pandemic, the global capacity for vaccines was somewhere around 5 billion doses a year. We know that based on the data, we need somewhere around 11 billion doses of manufacturing per year. And so we've invested in India, in South Africa, in Senegal, and other places around the world to help companies increase their capacity to manufacture more vaccines, working with US manufacturers like Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer and Moderna. That's an example of what we do. Sure, sure. So you already have a large presence in more than 100 countries, right? And you yes. work with the uh, US businesses already partnering with them. So maybe you can talk about more specific. I know vaccine um, manufacturing vaccine is one example that you use. Uh, but uh, how do you support American businesses in uh, markets like this if they really want to be a part of that new uh, partner with DFC? So we operate in lots of different sectors, in health, in agriculture, in manufacturing, in services, in banking, in finance. So if you're a business that is based in the United States, based in California, and let's say you're looking to expand in Indonesia, and you need to fill out uh, capacity to increase manufacturing, to increase distribution, to increase your services, you can apply for a loan, for political risk insurance, or for equity with the DFC. And we will engage with you just like any other financial intermediary would, We'll try to understand your business. We'll try to work, uh, understand your business plans. And then we'll work with you to figure out how much capacity you need through one of our products. So let's say that you actually have access to capital, but you're operating in a risky market where there's political uncertainty. There we can provide you with political risk insurance to insure against uh, expropriation, or other problems that might arise due to political uncertainty in, a, in an emerging market. Obviously, if, if you're doing business in the United States, even though you deal with complex regulations every day, you have a stable government, you have a rule of law, and you can have access to courts if there's a dispute. Often in emerging markets, you don't have that same legal structure, you don't have the same political stability, 
and you're taking risks. And what the DFC can do is help you de-risk your investment to help expand opportunities for U.S. businesses. So I hope you will come to our website. I hope you will call us. The congresswoman or staff know us personally very well. So you can go through her or her yep. staff to get to us. And if she calls or her staff calls, we're going to listen. You know, my that that's a given, obviously. And we welcome anyone who's watching and listening to our conversation. You know where to get hold of us. And if there is any particular uh, issue you want us to uh, follow through, uh, you can call us and my staff can help you. My again, let me give a plug in for CA 39 casework at mail.house.gov. Or you can contact me directly at, uh, well, you know me, many of you, <laughs> just contact my office and we'll make the connection directly to uh, DFC. But um, my district is often referred to as the gateway to Asia. You know, we're very close to the port of Long Beach, Los Angeles, and even San, uh, San Pedro. And we have a lot of movement of goods coming out of the uh, uh, these ports. And it's so very, very important um, area where we do a lot of international trade as well. But uh, can you explain DFC's involvement in the Asia region and why a business would consider working with DFC in that area? So we're very, very active in Asia. Uh, we're, our largest market is India. Mm -hmm. We're very, very active in Southeast Asia and the ASEAN countries. Um, and it's one of the fastest growing areas of the world. Uh, the markets are expanding rapidly. The populations are young and they're increasing in wealth and access to capital. So I know when I was in the private sector, Asia was one of the most exciting markets for us to pursue because the demographics, the fundamentals uh, were very, very attractive and in many countries, there obviously we're in a in a different situation because of COVID, where there's been you know deep contraction. But in normal times, they grow six, eight, ten percent a year in certain countries. Whereas in the United States, we may be growing one or two percent. So the the rates of growth are much faster. The demographics are very very attractive for lots of different products, and it's where it's where growth is and so that's where businesses i think in my experience want to pursue opportunity and obviously in the district in the area where uh you live it's it's a vibrant area with the transportation hubs with the port with one of the best airports international airports in the world it's easy to get to and it's a very diverse community um, with lots of ties to um different parts of asia and a huge immigrant population. So there are natural business ties in that part of the of the state um, to lots of countries in Asia. And we want to be a partner to you to help you expand your businesses. You also provide uh, advice on political environment uh, as they tend to uh, consider Asia as potential expanded uh, business opportunity areas. So we work closely with our embassies around the world and each embassy has different experts on the political situation, on the economic situation, on the regulatory environment. And we can, again, through the Congresswoman's offices, connect you with the right experts in your sector. So each embassy will have experts on manufacturing, on financial services, on agriculture, on logistics and transportation, on infrastructure. And we can we can connect you with those experts in each country to help you make your business judgments, help you make your risk assessments as you make your business plans. So we'd be delighted to, to help you there as well. You know, let's talk about uh, the development part of being a development finance institution. You know, in addition to providing loans and insurance to support businesses in emerging markets, DFC has a strong focus on achieving a positive impact in the places where you work, right? So can you tell yes, us absolutely. more about that mission? Well, our goal is to help lift people up, to help give them opportunity. 
which not only is good for those countries and those companies in which we invest or which we back, but it's also good for the United States and it's good to strengthen our relationships. So, you know, for example, we're in a global competition right now for influence and for capital uh, with China. And I know this is, an, this is an issue that Congressman Kim has been very, very focused on. And the, the DFC, along with other parts of the US government, want to be a resource and a good partner for many countries and many companies around the world to make sure that we drive positive development outcomes, help lift people out of poverty, help give people additional economic opportunity, and also help expand American influence through private sector investments. So, you know, in the United States, we have a particular form of, of finance and capital, which relies on and supports the private sector, which in the long term will help create the most sustainable economic opportunities for workers, for uh, technology, and for companies all around the world. Well, thank you. You know, um, I know we got some time left. Um, I wanna talk about if there is a typical client that DFC tends to work with. So we don't have a typical cli client. We support some projects that are really, really small businesses. And we support projects where we deploy hundreds of millions of dollars at a time. We also work through financial intermediaries um, through to provide micro loans and small business loans. We're very, very focused on providing opportunities for small businesses to have access to capital for women owned businesses for type of businesses that don't traditionally have access to capital. And so we have some transactions that are in the you know, very, very small amounts of money. We have some transactions which are in you know a million dollars and we have some transactions that actually exceed a billion dollars and so we are actually not focused on just size we're focused on impact and we're really focused on helping small and medium-sized businesses great the the impact that you make uh with these um you know priorities that you are putting on the partners that you bring uh, to work together, I think that's going to be tremendously important. And you mentioned, you know, I because I currently serve as a ranking member on the Small Business Committee's um, Subcommittee on Innovation, Entrepreneurship, and Workforce Development. Um, your agency's uh, priorities really align with mine, and I'm really focused on making sure that our small businesses have the tools that's needed. And again, another priority of mine as a legislator is to get out of the way and uh, let you guys do what you know best, right? So uh, with on that note, I just wanted to ask you if, um, you know, what are some of the agency's development priorities? You already mentioned some of it, focusing on woman-owned, minority-owned, um, Asian-owned. <laughs> so can you expand more on that? So we're very focused on global health. There's been underinvestment in healthcare all around the world, but particularly in developing countries. So that's not just with respect to vaccine manufacturing, which is obviously very important at the moment, but also with healthcare delivery, with products and services, um, with the entire health ecosystem. We're very focused on infrastructure and driving infrastructure opportunities, which can be in ports, it could be airports, it can be roads, it can be uh, lighting, it can be uh, technology. We're very focused on driving technological opportunities. Obviously, in the United States, we're blessed with broadband and access to technology all around the country. In many parts of the world, they don't have access to technology or it's very, very expensive. So we've invested in data centers, in subsea cables, in technology infrastructure to lower the cost of, of access for people all around the world. And we're very, very focused on providing opportunities for women, for women run businesses, for women own businesses, for, for businesses that have a large proportion of women in senior management. 
we're also focused on driving opportunities for for small women owned businesses. So, for example, we just provided a, a financing for a project um, in, a, in a low income country where in the previous four or five years, as they allocated capital, they only allocated capital to 1%, 1% of their capital uh, backed women owned businesses. And we gave them long term attractive financing if they hit a goal of 20% allocation to women owned small businesses. And so that's a very, very significant increase in opportunity for women run businesses that are small businesses uh, in this particular country. And that is a driving uh, priority for us as well. So that those are the sectors. And then in terms of the countries, we're very focused on Asia and particularly Southeast Asia. We're very focused on Latin America and we're very focused on Africa. So those are our regional priorities as well. So in those regional uh, priorities that you just mentioned, if the, uh, the folks that are listening in want to take the risk and expand their operations into those areas, what is the best way for them to learn more about DFC and whether or not they qualify for DFC support? Right. So I would encourage people to look at our website our website has a lot of information on both our priorities and also the process. Mm -hmm. Then I would encourage you to reach out to us either directly or through the Congresswoman or through her office and talk to our expert in the sector and in the region in which you're thinking about operating. And we can give you our perspective. We can walk you through the process. We can walk you through the type of information that we'll need. Obviously, we're allocating US taxpayer dollars, so we, won't, we have a job to protect taxpayer interests. And so we do due diligence on every transaction. And we ask the same type of information that any other banker would. So we go through an extensive due diligence process. We'd want to know your business plans. We'd want to learn about your track record. But basically, the key thing would be to look at our website and then to be in touch with us directly and we can find the right person that has the expertise in the country in which you want to operate and in the sector in which you operate. And I believe there is a, like a FAQ on your website too as well. Absolutely. Right? So I encourage everyone to check out the FC website uh, for initial uh, information that may be available to you. And if you are still in need of detailed information, this is why we're doing this today. Uh, once we close my conversation with David, we're, we're going to be uh, treated to a panel of discussion by and the presentation from the uh, DFC experts. So let me just uh, close by thanking you, David, for this wonderful conversation. I hope our audience had the uh, additional understanding of the role DFC uh, does and what it can do to help their businesses, especially as they consider um, you know, expanding into the other, uh, uh, you know, places around the world. So the investment that DFC supports helps to create jobs and opportunity around the world and it helps your business. So with that, I want to thank you so much everyone for joining, especially those uh, individuals who are doing business in and around 39 Congressional District. I wish you good luck and uh, let me take it back to Elsie so, or Lucy. So you can, uh, you know, start the panel discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank, Thank you, you very David. much. And thanks to Lucy and our Office of External Affairs for arranging this. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time, Congresswoman. What a wonderful conversation uh, and, and with Dave and to get that extra insight as we jumped in. Uh, to the business side of things. We truly appreciate your support and also the ability to collaborate on this on this event. So thank you so much for being generous with your time. With that, I'll go ahead and transition over. Uh, what I'm going to do is just do a very brief overview of who will be able to present, and then we're gonna throw it over to one of our specialists that is able to go much more in depth, and we hope that you find it extremely helpful as you look at next steps, and hopefully we've whet your appetite with that initial conversation. So we're going to have Allison Germack. She's our Deputy Vice President for the Office of Development Credit, followed by Erin Murphy, 
our director of Indo-Pacific. So a little bit deeper dive into the Asia. Oh, I got it wrong. I apologize. That's at the end. So on to Marlena Hurley, who's our managing director with the political risk insurance and reinsurance. Another product we offer, as was mentioned in the conversation between Representative Kim and Dave, Dave Marchick. We're going to have David Hester, our managing director of technical development, that will go over a brief piece as well. And then, my apologies on that, Aaron. Aaron Murphy, the director of Indo Pacific, uh, will bring it home with a bit more of an overview related to uh, Asia and just kind of more geopolitical uh, realities of, of where we operate. Uh, so we'll go with that. Uh, we've got our, I see our PowerPoint uh, queued up. Thank you, Hugh, our IT guy who's making this all possible. And with that, I will turn it over to Allison. Great, thank you so much, Lucy, and it's a pleasure to be with you all this morning. Again, my name is Allison Germack. I'm the deputy vice president of one of our financing divisions at DFC called the Office of Development Credit. And I'm going to begin this presentation by sharing just a couple of overview slides to underscore some of the themes that our COO Dave Marchick highlighted this morning in his fireside chat with the Congresswoman. And then from there, I'll talk a little bit about our financing programs before I turn the baton over to my colleague, Marlena. So if you, if you could kindly go to the next slide. What we offer, so again, some of this was already touched on this morning, but just to reiterate, these different pillars that you see on the slide are DFC's primary financial tools. And those include debt financing, namely direct loans and loan guarantees. The DFC also has the capability to make equity investments into companies or projects abroad. DFC can provide support to feasibility studies as well as financing to investment funds, private equity funds or debt funds operating in emerging market countries. We offer political risk insurance and we offer technical assistance funding. So we will touch on each of these different product offerings in the subsequent slides we'll be covering this morning. Next slide, Hugh. First, a few points on project eligibility. So regardless of the product or the tool uh, of interest to you, um, the DFC has a couple of threshold eligibility criteria. And we have highlighted on the screen a couple of the key criteria. The first is that the project involve significant participation by the private sector. So we are not a lender to sovereign entities or to governments, rather we are looking to mobilize private sector capital for investments in the countries where we operate. And so the projects we support typically are at least majority owned, if not fully owned by the private sector. We also require all of the projects or investments that we support to uphold strict environmental and social requirements. So the projects that we support are screened throughout our diligence process to ensure that they meet high standards on protection of the environment, protection of the labor force, as well as protections for the local community where the investment will take place. We do have a list of eligible countries, as our CEO Dave Marchek indicated. We have the website um, dfc.gov, which lists the countries where our programs are typically available. Again, at any given time, we're working in about 100 different countries, and our emphasis is on countries that are classified by the World Bank as low income and low slash or low hyphen middle income. And so if you're interested to see if a country of um, uh, interest to you is listed on our website, please go ahead and check that out. Or you can um, use the Q&A feature here in the, um, uh, in the presentation uh, to, to reach out to us to ask a specific question. And then finally, does my project fall within a prohibited sector? There are several industries where we do not operate. A couple of examples would be projects or investments um, that facilitate military sales. Uh, we don't do work in the production of tobacco. Um, we don't do any investment or support any investment that would facilitate offshoring of, of US uh, work or US, um, US uh, jobs. If we move to the next slide, Hugh. Uh, Mr. Marchek already touched on some of our investment priorities, but just to um, underscore a few of the key ones, climate is a major focus of our agency's investment priorities. That includes certain things um, that are maybe obvious, uh, like 
renewable energy, as you can see from the little icon here, a wind turbine, but it also includes construction and building projects that incorporate energy efficiency measures. It includes recycling projects. So all those projects that provide a benefit in terms of supporting climate adaptation or climate risk mitigation. Global health is another area of interest to the agency. Um, we spoke earlier in this session on our work in supporting vaccine manufacturing, uh, but we can expand that broader to support diagnostic and treatment of a variety of different ailments. We also are quite involved in supporting the supply chain of the health industry, as well as industries like food security and clean water. Gender equity, we, we touched on, we do have a pretty robust um, initiative to support women's economic empowerment. And then of course, the industries of uh, ICT, which stands for internet connectivity and technology, as well as inclusive growth, which would capture a lot of the financial services investments we do like microfinance. Next slide, please. So now this slide will take us to talking just a little bit um, more in detail about our debt product. So. Um, as I indicated, we have really two products that facilitate debt to companies or investment projects in emerging markets. We um, do have the ability to do a direct loan, and that's the primary debt product that we offer. So unlike the Small Business Administration, um, with which many of you may be familiar, the SBA's loan programs, which primarily are loan guarantees, at the DFC, what we're primarily underwriting are direct loans. So the company in question that is making an investment will apply directly to the DFC. The DFC will evaluate the loan proposal, and it is the DFC that underwrites and disperses the funds. We do also have the capability to do loan guarantees as well, but for the purposes of our presentation today, I'm primarily focusing on the direct loan product. Our loan sizes can go quite large. Um, we can loan um, well over $50 million in financing per project um, into the uh, billion uh, range for large infrastructure projects. We have two financing divisions within the agency that facilitate and structure our financings. Um, the division where I sit focuses on loan sizes typically between 1 million US dollars and 50 million US dollars. And I have a sister department uh, called the Structured Finance and Insurance Department, which will underwrite the larger transactions over $50 million, as well as all of our infrastructure projects. So we have two different divisions that really have personnel that um, have services and have support systems and processes tailored for these whole spectrum of project sizes and types. In terms of our loan tenors, the length of repayment period, we are quite flexible. For some of our clients, they are looking for tenors that are between, say, 5 and 10, 15 years. Some of our infrastructure projects need larger tenors, in which case we will look as long as 20, 25 years in some instances. All of our financing is very bespoke in terms of how we structure it, so it's very dependent on the project. And that is true both for how we price our loans. We can price them as fixed rate or floating. Uh, we can also really be very thoughtful in terms of how we structure the amount of debt per project. Most of our projects, um, our loan sizes will range somewhere between 50 and say 70% of the investment cost. Next slide, Hugh, please. In the interest of time, I'm not going to read this slide verbatim, but I will use this opportunity to highlight a couple of the key considerations for you as a business person or as an entrepreneur, as you're thinking about possibly reaching out to the DFC for a uh, loan request. We do, just like any bank, require a business plan and some supplemental materials, namely historical financial statements, as well as a financial projections model, which so how you would repay the loan. We have very detailed guidance on our website as to what type of information we look for in the business plan. So if anybody is interested to read these links in detail, please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to send them to you. But a couple of key takeaways I can share just very briefly. We are very interested to understand um, the history of the company applying for the financing. So if you're already operating 
either in California or in the market overseas where you're hoping to expand. We look for information about your history of operations, um, the background of the principles, um, and also what you would like to do with the financing you raise from the DFC and how you will repay that loan to DFC. We also look for information about the market for the product or service that you will be um, distributing. Uh, we look for information about the ownership structure of the company and the principles involved. Um, and then when you provide us your financial model, we will look to have clarity from you on the different underlying assumptions you've made um, to build that financial model. Um, so if you are looking at taking coconuts and producing coconut water, we would want to understand how you came up with the assumptions you did about you know, how long it will take to produce coconuts on the trees that you plant. Um, how long will it take you to um, be able to construct the facility? Um, how many customers do you think you'll procure and where? So we'll break down each piece of the investment process with you and understand what are those assumptions that are driving the numbers that you produce in your business plan. So I, I share that anecdote only to underscore that this is a very iterative process. It's a very collaborative process. So it's, it's not very uh, common to send in an application to the DFC and immediately be approved or, or disproved. What will happen is that we will review your business plan. We will get on the phone with you. We will ask questions. We may make recommendations. And we see this as a, as a partnership that we work together towards um, a prospective successful investment. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn to the next slide which I believe is our equity financing. Uh, just say a couple words about equity financing before I then turn the baton over to my colleague, Marlena. Um, this is a relatively new product offering for our agency. Our predecessor agency, OPIC, did not have equity authority. Um, so we have only had this ability to provide equity funding for about a year now. We can provide equity funding in one of two ways. First, we can um, provide equity to an investment fund. So if there is a fund manager here on the line and you are looking at raising an investment fund um, by raising capital from different limited partners and then looking to collect those funds and invest them into various investment opportunities in a particular geography, we do have the ability um, to provide an equity commitment um, to that fund. Um, and it is a way for you to hopefully mobilize other limited partners to also invest equity into a fund. We have a separate division within the agency called our Office of Investment Funds um, that does structure these investments. They have a rolling request for proposals. So if you're interested in learning more about this process, you can visit our website, the Office of Investment Funds section, and you can read a little bit about the type of information they solicit in their call for proposals. The other way in which we can provide equity financing is directly to companies. So if a company is raising a round of investment capital, Perhaps this is a relatively young company. Um, they've invested with funds raised from themselves, family, friends. Maybe they've gone out and done a first initial Series A round of investment, and now they're looking at raising another round of capital to further grow the company. This is another way in which DFC can potentially provide support. We can make a direct investment um, into the company. On the right side of the screen here, we've just indicated a couple of the baseline parameters. Um, so, for example, we will cap our participation no more than 30% of the uh, project or 30% of the investment. Um, and this is going to be a decision made on the viability of the transaction. Um, we do seek market rates of return in the equity investments that we make. In uh, the case of our equity program, investing into companies, a couple of the key sectors of focus for that team include health technology, education technology, as well as financial technology. 
Um, and the investment tickets, uh, i.e. the investment sizes, um, typically range somewhere between, say, roughly 5 million uh, and 15 million US dollars. So with that, uh, I will ask you to kindly forward to the next slide. And I will ask my colleague, Marlena Hurley, who's a managing director in our political risk insurance group uh, to tell us a little bit about what I think is one of our most exciting products, uh, which is our political risk insurance. Marlena, over to you. Thank you very much, Allison. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to provide an overview of DFC's political risk insurance program. Political risk insurance protects investors against political and certain macroeconomic events that have the potential to affect the viability of an investment and cause the loss of capital, investment returns, or business income. And these are risks which private investors are typically not equipped to manage through other types of risk mitigation. DFC can provide up to 1 billion per project in, uh, in insurance, although most projects we underwrite are much, much smaller in the range of 5 million to $50 million. There's no minimum project size, and we have done some very small projects as well, below $1 million. The insurance supports medium to long-term investments, 15, 20 years and more, and fills a gap in the commercial political risk insurance markets, um, which is much more short-term focused. And this makes uh, DFC additional. The insurance premium rates are set at the beginning of the uh, insurance policy and do not change over the full policy term. Once DFC has issued the insurance, we do not cancel the insurance policy for reasons of a deteriorating political situation and an increase of risks in the host country. This means that the US government stands behind the investor for the duration of the insurance contract and provides advocacy as needed. DFC can ensure equity, including retained earnings and shareholder loans, loans, uh, private sector loans, bonds and capital or operating leases from third party financial institutions, tangible property, including consigned equipment used to perform work or contract with the government. Uh, many other types of contracts, loans by private sector lenders to governments um, or state owned enterprises for large infrastructure projects and bid bonds and guarantees, including advanced payments and other types of um, investments where there is a value at risk. DFC statutorily re requires equity investors to retain 10% of a loss, um, but does provide 100% coverage for institutional lenders and commercial banks, which typically do not have as much control over the project. We also provide and uh, facultative reinsurance to private and public political risk insurance for similar projects as we would approve and routinely obtain reinsurance from the commercial markets on larger projects. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the main types of political risks that are covered by DFC insurance include currency inconvertibility, expropriation, and political violence. I'll go into a little bit more detail on that. Currency and convertibility insurance protects the investor against the inability to convert local currency into US dollars or other major currencies and or to transfer local earnings out of the host country. Um, inconvertibility events can be caused by adverse changes in foreign exchange regulations or laws that restrict or significantly delay the investor's ability to convert local currency. Um, this can also be, this can be typically caused by host government action or by failure to act. Um, it also protects against the deterioration in conditions governing the transfer of local earnings. Expropriation insurance uh, protects the investor against the loss of an investment due to an act or a series of acts by the host government that deprive the investor of its fundamental rights in the investment. Expropriation manifests itself in many ways, either as an outright expropriation or nationalization, or as a confisc uh, confiscations of property or ownership rights, or an expropriation of funds in a bank account. Um, 
but it can also mean discriminatory treatment <clears throat> and or regulatory overreach that deprives the investor of its fundamental rights in the investment. And we also refer to that as creeping expropriation. When an investment includes a contract with a foreign government, like a utility in a power project, CFC's insurance covers the utility's failure to pay an arbitral award um, and denial of justice uh, that it can accompany um, an effort to go to arbitration. Political violence is the third uh, general group um, of political risks that we insure against. And this political violence insurance protects the investor against losses due to political violence events in the host country. It includes all events such as war, revolution, politically motivated civil strife, terrorism, and sabotage. It does not include damage caused by labor strikes or student demonstrations for uh, non-political purposes. Um, it protects against damage to assets, loss of business income due to damage of assets, um, and it can even include critical infrastructure not owned by the investor, but that is necessary for the business to operate. It finally also includes forced abandonment, which can occur if the project country is forced to abandon operation of the project as a direct result of conditions created by political violence that make it impossible or unreasonably hazardous to carry on the operation of the project and continues for at least six months. CFC also provides specialty coverage for larger infrastructure projects, for example, and one of them is the breach of contract for capital markets. And this political risk insurance uh, coverage has an arbitration requirement as a condition to payment of a claim, and it falls under the umbrella of expropriation coverage, and it's generally referred to as arbitration award default cover. It is designed to support financing of qualified projects where a host governmental entity, either the government itself or a sub-sovereign or a state-owned entity is the borrower. Uh, this coverage is frequently used in connection with U.S. capital market bond offerings and allows issuers to use political risk insurance to de-risk investment structures um, in, in, with this credit enhancement. It can also be used by commercial banks or other institutional lenders, but it's less common for, for those types of investors. Often, we require a sovereign guarantee to accompany um, project documentation. The second uh, specialty structure is the non-honoring of a financial obligation, which is also designed to support financing of um, larger projects where a state-owned entity is the borrower under the financing. The um, insurance is available only in those countries with higher credit ratings of at least B or B plus um, and stable outlook, and where the host government provides an explicit irrevocable sovereign guarantee for project-related debt. The project must be financially sustainable on an overall basis from revenue sources and cost savings and are, um, that are identified and are related to the project. This coverage does not require arbitration at this Basel compliant. And for both of these specialty um, products, of course, we support private sector loans to such government entities. So very briefly, what are the benefits of political risk insurance to investors? First of all, it can help investors um, attract a larger pool of capital and obtain uh, long-term financing for projects. It deters against detrimental government interference. Um, DFC throughout the policy term provides advocacy to insured investors um, so that it never really gets to a claim situation. We cooperate with the private insurers and multilateral insurers on larger projects and together with them are even stronger. Um, I should also note that DFC has a very strong claims record um, uh, in its history since 1971. We have paid um, over 300 individual claims in a total amount of $1 billion, and that's dollars, then dollars, not today's dollars. And most importantly, we have a, a recovery rate of more than 100%, and this includes, of course, interest. Um, I uh, conclude my presentation here and uh, will turn this uh, over to David Hester to talk about technical assistance. Marlena, thanks very much. Good morning, everyone. 
Uh, I'm David Hester, as Marlena said. I'm the Managing Director for Technical Assistance here at DFC. Our Technical Assistance Program provides grant funding to businesses to do one of two things, either to make a business's project bankable so that DFC can provide debt finance, equity investment, or political risk insurance, or to improve an existing project for which DFC already has provided finance, equity, or insurance. And I'll start first with a couple of definitions. Our technical assistance program provides products that are referred to as either feasibility studies or just by the term technical assistance. And feasibility studies consist of analyses of a number of things that a bank like DFC needs to have analyzed before DFC can decide whether or not to provide a loan or an investment or insurance. Um, things like the technological feasibility of a project, um, the commercial feasibility of the project, um, whether or not the project has all of the permits it needs in order to move forward, um, that type of thing. So that's one type of product we provide funding for. Another we refer to just generally as technical assistance, and that can be any kind of work that is needed in order to make a project bankable for DFC finance or investment or insurance, as well as any type of work that is needed to increase the developmental impact of a project that DFC already is financing, um, or that would increase the commercial sustainability of the DFC client. And so for that type of technical assistance, if it's helping to develop a project and make it bankable, it could be later on in the project development process after a feasibility study has been done. So for example, if you're building a power plant, a feasibility study can look, it can include a geotechnical analysis of the site, uh, an analysis of the financial structure that the sponsor hopes to use for the project, um, and an analysis of environmental and social risk factors and how to address them. That would be the feasibility study work done earlier in the project development process. Later in the project development process, there could be technical assistance work that we fund that includes things like design of the power plant itself. So in terms of some basic characteristics of our, of our program, we tend to provide funding in the amount of between $100,000 and $10 million. Those are not set limits. We can go below $100,000 if there is a, a good reason to do that. It's just that we've generally found that once the amount of our, amount of our technical assistance or feasibility study assistance goes below $100,000, it just doesn't really make sense for us in terms of our internal resources to do that type of very small activity. And in terms of the upper limit, there is no upper limit at all, but as a practical matter, it's unlikely that we're ever going to have a technical assistance or feasibility study activity that would cost more than $10 million in DFC funding. Um, I've already talked about the general purposes of the work that we do. Our work, we share the cost with the business that's developing the project or the business that already has a DFC loan. So we pay half of the cost of the feasibility study or technical assistance work and the business share pays the other half. Um, we can disperse our grant funds directly to the business that is the grantee that we're trying to help, or we could disperse those grant funds to a company that's doing the work that the business who is our grantee needs to have performed. If we provide a grant for project development work, so work that's needed in order for a business to get a DFC loan or investment or insurance, and later on the business does get a loan or investment or insurance, then the project sponsor, the business will pay us back the grant amount that we provided. Um, one important point is that all of what we call our technical development activities, which are feasibility studies and technical assistance, they all have to be connected to either a potential DFC project or an existing DFC project. And that's because the legal authority that we have from Congress says that our feasibility studies and technical assistance funding is only for potential or existing DFC projects. So we work very closely with Allison and Marlena and all of our other colleagues who are involved in debt financing, equity investment, and political risk insurance. I know that we've talked a lot about um, interest in, in Asia and about business developments in Asia. Um, the country that our technical assistance and feasibility study program has provided the most um, funding for so far is India. And we're also in exploring the possibility of providing funding in a number of other countries in Asia, including Indonesia, Vietnam, Nepal, and Iraq. That's a very brief overview of our technical assistance uh, and feasibility study program. We're always happy to ask, answer any questions about it, whether that's in the question and answer session at the end of today's roundtable, or at any time in the future, you're welcome to reach out to me 
um, anytime. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have about your business and about ways we can help your business with its projects in countries around the world. Um, so with that having been said, I'm happy to turn it over to my colleague, Aaron Murphy now, and we can go to the next slide. Thanks very much. Thank you, David, and hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to have you here to discuss um, our work in Asia. Uh, my name is Erin Murphy, and I'm the director for Indo-Pacific, and I also consider myself uh, one of the luckier people in the DFC in that I get to work on the Indo-Pacific and that we um, not only have the most exciting markets, the fastest growing markets, but also the incredible and rich diversity of the investments that we have and of course food. So it's great to talk to the gateway to Asia and to bring it all together, bring everything that folks have talked about today and how we can bring that together. Um, as David mentioned, uh, we have investments in uh, or technical assistance investments in this region, but from all the presentations that you heard, political risk insurance, equity, technical assistance and debt financing, you can find a range of those investments in Asia. So as you can see from this chart, uh, we have $5.4 billion worth of investment in Indo-Pacific. Uh, that's our third largest market for the DFC, but it's one of our fastest growing markets. It's our goal that we double that um, in the next five years and are really going to look to the business community to help make that happen. We invest across a range of low and lower middle income countries throughout the Indo-Pacific. That includes South Asia, India, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, the Maldives. Um, and this is my uh, portfolio, but we certainly cover um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia as well. But for my purposes today, I'll just cover um, the countries that I do, which is you know dozens of them. Uh, we also cover Southeast Asia, the Pacific Islands, and Mongolia. Uh, we don't invest in high-income countries in Northeast and Southeast Asia, uh, but we do partner with them, uh, including Japan and South Korea, Australia, Singapore, and Taiwan. Um, so we do work with them in a range of investments. I'll go over a few of the types of projects that we are working on um, and give you a sense of, of what the type of investments that we're making. Again, we work predominantly with the private sector. And we can invest in local companies, but we can also invest alongside American companies in their expansion overseas or in their investments overseas. Um, for example, we do a lot of investments with small and medium sized enterprises in India, which again, as uh, several of my colleagues have mentioned, is one of our largest markets, but also across, across Southeast Asia. So in the Philippines, we provided loan portfolio guarantees to agribusinesses, small and medium sized enterprises and sustainable fisheries. In Cambodia, we've also provided financing to microfinance institutions and small and medium sized enterprises that support women entrepreneurs. In Indonesia, we have a lot going on. Uh, we have provided loan portfolio guarantees on healthcare facilities, small and medium sized enterprises on food production and along the food value chain. Um, we've also provided financing to small and medium sized enterprises that provide sustainable agriculture, clean energy and support women. For Southeast Asia, um, we're really looking to enhance our growth and build our pipeline in this region. It's really quite small at the moment. Um, India has really sucked up a lot of energy and attention. And while we want to continue the level of investment that we have in India, we'd really like to expand more thoroughly into the Indo-Pacific as well, where we're looking at the Philippines, Indonesia, and Vietnam as key markets. We're certainly looking for investments elsewhere, but those are the fastest growing and most exciting uh, areas that we are really interested in. Uh, for India, again, this is our largest and most active portfolio in the Indo-Pacific. Um, we have uh, more than a billion dollars of investments in this region, and it ranges across sectors. Renewable energy is one of our biggest. For example, for this year, we have four to five hundred million dollars in the renewable energy sector alone. A lot of this is in uh, solar power. We've also provided a lot in terms of microfinance loans and on lending to SMEs, uh, especially where it goes to support agriculture and ag tech, but also to support women entrepreneurs. Uh, we've also expanded our investment in healthcare. 
as Dave Marchek noted in the his comments and during his fireside chat with Representative Kim, that we're really looking to expand our investments in healthcare. And unfortunately, COVID-19 has has forced us to look at how can we address this. It's, it's allowed us an opportunity, if you will, to really target companies that are working in the vaccine production space, but we're also looking to support businesses along the healthcare value chain. So for example, one investment that we did was with Biological E, uh, where we provided debt financing to expand a production line up for Johnson & Johnson vaccines. Um, we're also looking at other countries around the world, including uh, two transactions in Africa, but we're definitely seeing Indo-Pacific as uh, a key area for pandemic preparedness but also for great opportunities along the healthcare value chain, whether it's cold chain logistics, uh, providing sterile bags, tubing, vials, uh, syringes, or pharmaceuticals and therapeutic um, advancements when it comes to COVID-19, but also for other healthcare issues as well. So I'm going to ask Hugh if you can turn to the next slide. I'll give you more specific examples of some of the work that we do. Uh, one is strengthening food security in India, and I'll discuss what this transaction is and how it fits within DFC's uh, core pillars um, that my my colleagues previously highlighted, but also that Dave Marchek highlighted as well. Um, we provide an equity investment in fresh to home foods, and this was to expand an e-commerce business in food um, that uh, want to expand their operations in India. So again, we were taking an investment, a company that wanted to expand its operations. It was not just to give them a capital injection, but allow them to expand in several new markets across India. So Fresh to Home is an e-commerce company. They sell fresh feet, fresh feet, <laughs> no, they don't. Fresh fish, meat, and vegetables across major metropolitan areas in India. Um, they operate the largest cold chain network in India, which is so critical to providing food safety um, and enables uh, consumers with uh, to be able to purchase food that's chemical and preservative free at mass market prices. For us, supporting India is a key key aspect of our investment, um, but we also want to adhere to what the key concerns are in a country. And so for India, agriculture and food cultivation is the largest source of livelihood in India. And DFC certainly wants to provide that. One, it's a commercially viable investment for us. We're expanding a successful businesses, business um, and their expansion to other markets. They had a proven track record, strong financials, and a good business plan to show how they were going to expand and what they were going to do with DFC financing, but also noted how DFC financing was so critical to that. Um, it also had that strong developmental impact. Again, we're providing more jobs in the country. We're providing access to affordable food but also safe food. So this really uh, checked a lot of boxes for us um, in terms of investment. Hugh, can you please turn it to the next slide? So this is reducing ocean waste in India uh, or Indonesia. If you've looked at any news or you've swam in the ocean, especially in Indonesia, which unfortunately I have not had uh, the benefit of doing, but I would like to change that once the pandemic eases, um, you're swimming in trash. Uh, there's plastic waste everywhere in Southeast Asia is certainly one of um, the key areas where we have these large waste patches. Um, for this project, it really highlighted a lot of key DFC pillars. Um, it was both a commercially viable, bankable project, but also had a high developmental impact. One, Indonesia is one of the key markets that we want to increase our pipeline. Again, we've been relatively thin um, in our investments in Southeast Asia. And this is the fourth largest country by population. So it makes sense for us to be here in a, in a big way. One, this also supports our climate initiative and that includes reducing ocean waste. But what this business does, which is really interesting and Treaty Oasis is that they reduce ocean waste by recycling used plastic bottles and turning this into packaging materials and textiles. It's a really innovative technology. Um, if you've ever seen a pair of Rothy's, the shoe that uses um, ocean waste, I'm not saying that Trading Oasis does that, but that's one example of, of how you can see textiles that use that uh, plastic um, in, in play. Um, the other great thing about this, this company is that it's a women-owned small business. 
And so that helps with our 2X initiative where we provide a gender lens of, to our investments overseas. So this really checked a lot of boxes for us um, and it's a really exciting business for us. So I'm really happy to answer any questions that you have in the Q&A about our investments in Asia and Indo-Pacific and how this all ties together with our products and really hope to be able to support your businesses overseas and really enhance our pipeline in Asia. So if I could turn to the last slide and maybe the most important slide for everyone, this is our contact information. Um, we'll make sure that you have access to this, but take a photo of this, a screenshot, whatnot. Um, but this is how you'd be able to get in touch with us in terms of asking any follow-up questions that we don't get to today to get in touch with us uh, about our projects. So we have Allison's um, contact information there, Marlena's. David and myself, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. We are here for you to answer any questions that you have um, and to make sure that you know how to work with us and that we can take advantage of the opportunities that you present to us. So with that, I will close and turn it back over to Lucy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. I'm actually gonna pass the bill over here to Allison as our moderator uh, to kick off Q&A. Feel free to enter in the chat any questions you may have, we're more than happy to address them. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Lucy, and pleasure to, to be on the, the microphone again. Thanks to everyone for um, listening to these slides. We have the Q&A open, um, so if you have a question, please feel free to type it out, and I will read it out to the, the panelists. In the interim, I did post a link that the Congresswoman was kind enough to mention earlier in the presentation. Uh, that is the link to the DFC Finance Frequently Asked Question Sheet. So if um, anyone on the line today is particularly interested in our financing products, namely the debt products for our loans and our loan guarantees, this link will take you to some more detailed information that you can download and, and review at your leisure. So again, the chat box is open and I'm happy to take some questions. In the interim, there is one question that has come in, which I can read out to the panelists. Um, what first step should a business take to get involved with DFC? Um, so perhaps I can um, start by talking about the first steps from the perspective of someone interested in financing, and then I can turn it over to uh, Marlena to talk specifically for, for insurance. But for those on the line who are interested in our loan product, in our debt product, we um, are, as I said earlier, very collaborative. So often what will happen is a business person will reach out to me or to one of my colleagues with, if not a draft business plan, then perhaps a brief executive summary of a business plan, a two to three page memo, if you will, that walks us through what is the nature of the investment you're looking to make, um, what is the financial plan? Where are you in raising the funds for the project? And a little bit about your background. And so then someone on my team, I have a team of, of several business development specialists. One of our specialists will review that information and follow up with you fairly quickly to schedule a time to discuss it. Um, they'll walk through on the phone with you, some initial questions they have, offer some feedback, and with the goal of working towards putting in a formal application submission through our website. And what that entails is filling out a brief form, not a very large form as far as government forms are concerned, it's about 12 questions. So really what we rely on more is, is the business plan that you produce, the financial model you produce in your historical financial statements. So again, one of my colleagues would sit with you on the phone. They will walk through with you their feedback. They will provide you some direction in terms of the kind of materials you should be prepared um, to develop and submit to the DFC. And then once those application materials are received, again, we continue to work hand in hand with you to hopefully advance the application or to provide you with feedback in terms of what we would look for you to uh, do or what milestones we would look for you to accomplish before we could progress the application further. Marlena, would you like to say a few words about how the process would be initiated for those interested in the insurance? Thank you, Allison. Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, 
since we are insuring investments, you know, either private equity um, or, or loans, uh, we are similarly interested in uh, receiving a some a, some kind of presentation on the project just to understand what the project is. Uh, where it is located, um, who the parties or participants are, who the investors are, lenders are, and so on. And, um, and, and generally, our process starts with um, either a, uh, an email and, and a discussion with the investors, or uh, an investor can also just uh, register the project on, on, on our website. And the registration doesn't mean very much at all. It's just a, a way of getting in touch with us, and it doesn't obligate uh, the investor to anything. Um, it doesn't obligate us to anything either, but but we have the net project record. So one of these two ways, I mean, you can always, of course, uh, write to my email address um, that was outlined in that presentation. Um, and then we would we would uh, talk about the project. We would talk about the the insurance that you would need and what amounts and for what tenor and so on. Um, and uh, and again, on the insurance side as well, it's an iterative process. Um, we we don't do a credit evaluation, but we have to make sure that the the that we know who the investors are and that they are that they have a good track record and they, um, you know, they have uh, you know, a little bit of work experience in the countries where uh, where they're making an investment and so on. Um, so uh, we are really um, very we have different you know different. Uh, lots of different companies and lots of different ways of being approached, and uh, we're just happy to hear from you. Great. Thank you, Marlena. We have another question received, um, thanking the panelists for the examples of projects and asking for the list of more examples of DFC supported projects. So I have just typed out in the chat box and I'm sending um, to the participants a link to the place on DFC's website where you can see a map which links to uh, the list of all of the investments that the DFC has made. So if you're interested in a particular geography um, or a particular product, you can filter the list to, to see a more comprehensive list of the types of investments DFC has supported. Um, but perhaps um, just taking advantage of the uh, human capital we have here on the line, I could ask my colleagues if they'd like to just share brief examples of, you know, perhaps their favorite project that they've been involved with. Um, maybe we can start with uh, Aaron Murphy, if you'd like to, you know, share a couple words about a particular project that you've been involved with um, that you're pretty excited about. Sure. Um, I was only involved in the, the latter stages of this, so I can't claim a lot of credit for it. Um, but we had a Vietnam aquaculture project, and it was one of our very few investments in Vietnam. Um, but I think what it did was really show that we're committed to Vietnam, we're committed to their fisheries industry. But essentially what it was, um, was investing in a company that does sustainable fish farming. Um, and so it helped with the the sea to market um, transaction, making sure that um, the value chain and the supply chain was uh, transparent. But it supported uh, sustainable fishing, which we know is a growing issue. Um, and it also supported uh, agriculture and uh, food production livelihood in Vietnam, which is really important to um, the economy, but also to people's livelihoods. So it really kind of supported several things that DFC um, supports, but it's also critical to the Vietnamese market. Um, plus, I was just very excited that we had such a cool project uh, in Vietnam, because I think when people think of DFC and US government financing, it's we support bridges and airports and ports, and certainly we do that, but then we do these small types of projects that has such a big impact on communities um, that you know may seem small but have a huge impact so this is definitely one of my favorite ones thanks i remember this one uh, that was one that our team had worked on and that was barramundi uh, yes uh, that's right and yeah which i was always excited to to try to go on that trip and, and sample <laughs> yeah yeah sample. one day one day, one day someday right <laughs> marlena what about you do you have a project that you would share with the group one that you've worked on that um folks may find particularly interesting uh so, so we have don't have recent uh completed projects in the asia region but we're currently working on a couple 
Um, one is actually a health project that is focused on eradicating tuberculosis um, in, in Indonesia. And uh, another one that we're working on is in a, in a similar region, and um, it's focused on, on providing water to, um, uh, to underserved communities. So that's the kind of um, uh, deals that we're looking at right now, and we hope to um, include them soon. And David, what about you from the technical assistance standpoint? Sure, Allison, thanks very much. I mean, one of my favorites is a technical assistance grant we provided for a dairy company in Eastern India. Um, and this is, I know, Allison, you know, that this is uh, the dairy company had received a $10 million loan from DFC to expand its operations. Um, and the dairy company sources its milk from more than 60,000 small farmers, and most of them are women. So the technical assistance grant that we provided did two things. The first thing we did that it does is it sets up a program where women farmers will get paid directly electronically to their mobile phones instead of having a cash man come around and deliver cash periodically. And that helps the women farmers in a number of ways. One thing is it ensures that men who live in the same household as a woman farmer won't take her money when the cash man comes by. It also ensures that the cash man himself won't steal from the woman farmer, which unfortunately has happened sometimes in the past. It also gives the woman farmer a track record of payments. So when she wants to go to a microfinance institution to get a loan to perhaps buy another cow or to start up a business out of her home, she can do that. Um, and it also gives the woman farmer the certainty knowing she really is going to get paid. No one's going to steal from her. And so she knows what, what the results will be from the work that she does. Um, another part of that technical assistance grant was to help farmers with their, the health of their cattle. So it involves having veterinary technicians go to villages and teach farmers good practices for cattle health. It involved training in um, Odia, the local language that was provided um, directly in person and also by video. So we all have a number of favorite projects, but that was one of my favorite ones. Thanks, David. That was a really, really interesting project. And uh, maybe to close it out, I'll share um, one of my favorites, which I think is really appropriate for a venue like this. Um, we had uh, an event a number of years ago for the small business community back when we were OPIC. We weren't even DFC yet, um, but to help U.S. small businesses learn a little bit about OPIC and the different tools we can help, um, uh, tools that we can offer to help them expand in international markets. And one of the companies I came to meet was a company based out of Cambridge, Massachusetts called Quantum ID Technologies. And Quantum ID Technologies had a really interesting um, uh, capability to use an RFID technology to track cargo, um, which is really critical in emerging markets and a lot of these airports and ports where it can be very busy and very difficult to keep track of, of commodities. Um, and so Quantum ID was interested to expand into the emerging markets. Um, we worked with them first in India, where we provided them a small loan to help them enter that market, and then subsequently worked with them uh, to help Quantum ID enter the Philippine market. Um, but it all started from just a conversation um, at an event not too dissimilar from this, although in person. <laughs> um, but it was a great opportunity for a U.S. small business uh, to get to know us and for us to get to know a U.S. small business that hadn't heard of us before. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to replicate that story with uh, many of you on the line. Um, I know that we are quickly approaching time. Um, so I, at this point, uh, would like to, to thank everyone for their engagement and for their excellent questions. I'm going to turn the baton back over to my colleague, Lucy, uh, to share some final words before we close off for the day. And I believe we're going to pull up our contact information slide one last time so that if any of you on the line had not yet had an opportunity to write it down, you can take it down and follow up with us um, at your leisure to the extent you have any uh, private questions you'd like to, to ask. So with that, I'll turn it back to Lucy. Thanks, Allison. Hugh, uh, can you queue up that, that last slide again one more time for contact info? Thank you. I just wanna make sure you get one more chance to see that. Uh, we've had a wealth of knowledge here and I official that you found uh, them both engaging and, and uh, informational, the, the presentations. A big thank you to my colleagues for joining us. Again, a thank you to the office of Representative Young Kim that she was able to join. And I know there was a lot of back efforts on that as well. So thank you to her office for participating and being our.
financial solutions to the most uh, critical challenges throughout the world. Uh, we stand ready, and, and that's our that's our purpose. It's an interesting role to play within the U.S. government, but it's a it's a critical and one that we t a critical role that we take very seriously. So, with that, we hope you have a wonderful afternoon, and we hope to hear from you soon. Goodbye.